Syria peace talks end without major breakthroughs. As the question of political transition remains the biggest sticking point in Geneva, as John Kerry flies to Moscow to meet Vladimir Putin, will it fall to the US and Russia to push things forward? And are they capable of forging a grand bargain in Syria? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Nick Clark. Two weeks of indirect negotiations in Geneva have not produced the breakthrough some hoped that they would. Representatives of the opposition and the Syrian government haven't even come close to talking about the big issues, including the fate of President Bashar al-Assad. But neither have the talks been a complete disaster. More talks are scheduled for next month, with the possibility that the US and Russia may be able to push things forward. Before we bring in our guests, Al Jazeera's diplomatic editor, James Bayes, evaluates how much progress has been made. These talks have been taking place in Geneva for almost two weeks, and at the start, the UN mediator, Stefan Di Mastura, said they would be substantive talks about Syria's future, and he said they'd get to what he described as the mother of all issues, political transition in the country, taking it from where it is now, a state of civil war, to a new transitional government, which would take the country within 18 months to free and fair elections, something that Syria hasn't seen for more than 40 years. The problem has been this. The two delegations, or the two main delegations, have been having meetings with Mr Di Mastura. The main opposition bloc, called the High Negotiations Committee, has been talking about its vision of the future of Syria. They've given detailed papers to Mr Di Mastura. But on the government side, yes, they presented a paper of broad principles, but during the rest of their meetings they've talked about procedure, about the agenda, and then after the Brussels attack they talked about counter-terrorism but they've not talked about this key issue, political transition. In fact, the leader of their delegation, Chief Negotiator Bashar al jafri has said that he doesn't feel that the issue of President al-Assad and his future is even on the agenda. He said it's not up for discussion. So during a nearly two-week period, they have not got down to the key issue. Having said that, you can't describe these talks as a failure because this process also allowed some besieged areas that had had no humanitarian access to get access and there's been a cessation of hostilities now in place for three and a half weeks and that clearly has saved many lives. So that is the context of the situation. Let's now go to our guests to get their thoughts. In Washington, D.C., we have Richard Weitz, who's senior fellow and director of the Center for Political Military Analysis. That is at the Hudson Institute. In Oxford, in the United Kingdom, Igor Sutiojin, who's a senior research fellow at the Royal United Services Institute. And uh, crossover to Dubai via Skype, we have Samar Al-Taki, who's director at the Orient Research Center. Gentlemen, welcome to you all to discuss these uh, important issues. And if we can go to Washington, D.C., first of all, to Richard, uh, Richard White. Uh, Richard, very little progress at these talks, as we just outlined, but really it would have been astonishing if there had been any kind of breakthrough, wouldn't it? Well, what's even worse is even if there was a Russia-U.S. breakthrough and they were able to agree precisely on the, the terms of transition and how the ceasefire will be implemented and even a, a transition to a coalition government, uh, the problem is Russia and the United States, or in this case Moscow and Washington, don't have the kind of power they had during the Cold War where they could just call up uh, Cairo and Tel Aviv and work out a ceasefire directly with the parties here. It's just so complicated. You've got parties that wouldn't ever listen to what Washington and Moscow said. You've got others that will argue back. And so it's, it's just going to be very difficult to achieve a, a peace settlement, no matter how hard Kerry and his Russian partners strive. Uh, and Igor, before we uh, go on to explore the uh, possibilities that this, these talks that uh, John Kerry is having in Moscow, Igor, what are your thoughts about uh, the talks that we've just seen that have wrapped up today? We were never really likely to be any further ahead than we are right now. Is that right? Well, it doesn't seem that there is very good chances for progress because, uh, first of all, I completely agree with the analysis from, from the states. Uh, there is no uh, ultimate power uh, which Russia might uh, execute in Syria, so they can 
they cannot just order what to do, first of all. And secondly, uh, the Kremlin tries to solve many other problems uh, uh, connected, connecting them, tying them down to Syrian issues. And that is Ukraine, that is Crimea, and without progress on that, Russia would be not willing to make progress on Syria. So I do not have that we have uh, good chances. Okay, but as far as Syria itself is concerned, as our correspondent James Bayes alluded to in his report that we just saw, uh, there has been a pause in the fighting. Uh, aid has been getting through. The first, perhaps, tiny steps have been made. Yeah, uh, first steps have been made, and uh, that is good. But uh, you know that uh, the Kremlin's practice now is to make first step forward and then two steps back if it is not satisfied with the concessions on the opposite side. So uh, that is why I do say that if Kerry will refuse to, to make some concessions to the Kremlin, the Kremlin will not very much cooperate on Syria, especially keeping in, mi in mind that interests in Syria of the two sides, they are just opposite. When uh, the uh, United States want actually to change the regime there, the Kremlin wants to preserve this regime there. With opposite interests, well, you do not have chances to, to progress. Okay, well, we'll examine uh, what potential concessions John Kerry might make and uh, what might come in the other direction in Moscow. But first, let's uh, just get the view of Samuel Taki where we're at right now. Uh, what's your, your grasp on, on what we can uh, really look at optimistically, if anything, at this point? I think uh, there had been a kind of uh, an agreement between Mr. Lavrov and Mr. Kerry at a certain moment that it would be possible to push for a common government where Bashar Assad will be will be present, but with uh, some of the main figures of the Syrian opposition will be also uh, participating. Unfortunately, uh, what uh, we understand from the situation now in Damascus, the Syrian regime had not shown the necessary cooperation with Russia itself. Uh, to go through this over this uh, this agreement, and actually uh, the the Russians had shown that they don't have lots of leverage, even with all the might they did have, the military might they did have on the ground, they were not able to force Bashar al-Assad to accept even this level of uh, cons uh, concessions. Uh, regarding the Syrian opposition. And now the Americans had stepped back, uh, not to the formula of uh, Vienna, one which is based on a common government, but they stepped back uh, themselves and uh, Mr. Demistura back to the Geneva concept, which is based on the uh, transitional uh, governing uh, 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 institutions. And this is a, a setback that shows that uh, what had been achieved in the last nine months between the two sides had been had, had not, has, is no more working. And I, I just wonder, after the Russian withdrawal, what Russia do have as uh, as leverage? What they ha what they uh, what they were not able to do to make the Syrian regime do what they can do ma make now is is very much to, ima to imagine because they they lost lots lots of their leverage in Syria. Uh, was your sense uh, when, when you was your sense, Sami, when you looked at these the talks going on in Geneva that uh, that the Syrian government actually want any kind of resolution from the talks because, uh, as we heard a little bit earlier, they became bogged down in procedure and issues of agenda and so forth before getting into any substantive issues at all. Do they actually want a resolution? I think they need uh, a certain uh, lessening of the pressure on them from the Russian side and from the international community. But at the end of the day, what we are understanding from the, the Syrian delegation representing the regime is that uh, they are really perplexed and uh, they are now relying much more on the elections that Bashar al-Assad is planning to make and uh, trying from there to forge a new legitimacy and to show a new, uh, an alternative track to the current uh, negotiations. I think uh, they, they, were, they were saying that they are not now prepared to proceed in the negotiations. Uh, better is to wait for the next uh, elections. And I think this uh, shows that there is, they are really perplexed, especially that the, the Russian withdrawal came exactly at the, the beginning of uh, the, the negotiation, which had, which had really weakened their positions in the negotiations. OK, uh, uh, Igor, do you agree with that? It, and if so, if, if you think that it weakened the, the Russians' position, why, why did they withdraw at that point? 
Well, it is not exactly a weakening position. To some extent it seems that it might be a strengthening Russian position, because uh, what we had in Syria over the last several weeks was uh, the tail wagging the dog, when Bashar al-Assad got a bit too much freedom of action and decision what to do and how to behave, not listening to his uh, Kremlin's masters. And so it might be the message from the Kremlin to Bashar al-Assad, look, you must listen to us, otherwise you lose your position. So uh, that might might be strengthening the Russian influence over, over Syrian uh, government, first of all. Secondly, Russia, Russian withdrawal was uh, a bit strange, because withdrawing part of aircraft jet uh, fighters, they returned several uh, additional helicopters. So they actually just substituted one type of aircraft with another type of aircraft. So they are not really withdrawing, they are staying there. Uh, and Richard Wright, so what's your, your sense of uh, Russia's ability to, to wield some influence on uh, President Assad, uh, given the withdrawal from, um, from the battlefield and so forth? I have to agree that with the uh, pullback, um, what it was conditional, it was partial, President Putin made clear that it could come back. So I don't think it really hurt the Russian position with uh, negotiating position in general. With respect to Assad, uh, Igor is probably right. I'm not, it's a bit opaque, that relationship between Assad and the Kremlin. Uh, I, you know, I, whether if the Kremlin can, if, if the Kremlin can actually demand Assad leave power as part of transition, I don't know. But the withdrawal does give them a bit of leverage. But overall, the effect of the Russian military intervention over the six months was, I think, to save the Assad regime. It looked like it was going to be defeated in the battlefield. People, it was losing troops. It was losing territory. The Russian intervened, stabilized, put them in a very strong position. So overall, the Russians have, I think put the uh, government in, uh, in, in, and themselves in a good position uh, in negotiations. But again, I don't think it's, in the end, it's going to lead to an agreement uh, that's going to have an enduring effect. Though you are right, there's been some reduction in the fighting, some reduction in casualties, increased humanitarian flows. So that's all to the good. Okay. Uh, and Richard, uh, political transition is the divisive issue, isn't it? The mother of all issues, as Stefan de Mistura says. So now John Kerry is on his third visit uh, in a year to Moscow, sounding out Russia's latest position on President Assad, as we've already been discussing. From John Kerry's point of view, from the United States point of view, what would they find acceptable when it comes to the Russian position on this? Right. It's a, a good question because it, the, the position, it changes a bit what they're saying over time and you know, how long Assad could stay in power and whether the, I mean, I imagine what Russia would try to do, and then I'm not clear whether they accept this, is just replace Assad with somebody similar to Assad or at least from that same ilk that would ensure that Russia could control still its naval and air bases, that Russian influence would remain, that, that it would look pretty much like the Assad regime, whereas the U.S. wants a much more comprehensive transition. Um, and then how they would compromise. And I imagine some people in Russia are thinking about what might come after the Obama administration and whether their bargaining position might improve um, depending on the outcome of the U.S. elections. Uh, and Igor, you were talking about concessions that John Kerry would have to make. What would they be? Well, uh, these concessions must be connected, uh, related to Ukraine, to sanctions against Russia, and uh, these connections are very much, you know, desired by the Kremlin, because to be honest, uh, the fate of Bashar al-Assad himself is not that critical for, for Russia. I completely agree that uh, the key interest uh, for Russia in Syria is Russia's interest in Syria, preservation of its presence, preservation of its basis, guarantees for that basis, and concessions for Russia in other the related areas. So, uh, most probably, Lavrov and uh, Putin tomorrow will um, will ask uh, for some concessions regarding uh, Ukrainian sanctions. Okay. So, so if that's the case, then, then what could they? What are they likely to agree on? Would they be in a position where they could come out of a meeting somewhere down the line, perhaps tomorrow, next day, and say, uh, okay? President Assad has got to go, and then this is what we need to present at the table, and when the talks resume in two weeks' time, in, in the middle of April. 
Well, it seems that the agreement will be agreed to not agree now, to postpone the, any decisions, any agreement for, for the future, because the current timing is not very good for, for Russia to, uh, you know, to require for, for uh, concessions, because of Nadezhda Savchenko case, uh, which was very, you know, contaminating uh, case in, in this um, Ukrainian situation. So it seems that we will have just another hollow round of discussion between uh, Lavrov and Kerry, Lav uh, Kerry and Putin. It seems so that we will not have any progress. Okay, so Samar Altaki, is that how you see it? A hollow round of discussions, uh, these talks that are ongoing on now. But the, the problem is, the fact is that uh, the process needs a US Russian agreement, doesn't it? Uh, the problem is not only about the Russians and the Americans. There are regional players that are waiting for them to see what they can achieve. And from the other side, uh, they are. Uh, I disagree completely. I don't think the Russians uh, uh, will be able to return as uh, powerfully as they used to be. For example, what they did not achieve, uh, they did not achieve with the Syrian regime any strategic change or turn over in the situation so that they were not able to, for example, to catch just uh, Shur, which is a very, very strategic point, which was really on the verge of falling, but, but the Syrian opposition and other forces were able to uh, to pull them back, uh, and the problem of the sp spread too thin of the Syrian army. At the end of the day, what I'm trying to say is that if the Russians and the Americans come out with uh, a hollow uh, a meeting, then uh, that will show that the regional forces will return to feel themselves more capable of influencing what's going on on the ground. And uh, I think that uh, there are real risks that the ceasefire will not continue. And uh, the, what had been achieved uh, during the Russian existence on the Syrian's uh, land, I think could be turned in, in, in one or one week or 10 days, uh, turn, turned back uh, to the, in the hands in the, of the Syrian opposition. Uh, subsequently, what I would say is that uh, it's a really uh, a dangerous situation where there is a vacuum in the international agreement, and uh, this will give lots of uh, you know, opportunities to regional players and to many wild cards like, uh, like I say, uh, ISIS and other players on the ground that are not very much interested in what's going on between Lavrov and Mr. Kerry. It's a very bleak picture, gentlemen, that you're uh, painting right now. Uh, Richard, where can we find any points of agreement uh, between the Syrian government and the opposition? Anywhere at all? Well, fundamentally, uh, they, they can agree that... Um well, you know, that's how I think. I think fundamental, the fundamental problem, as I see it, is that whenever uh, we have these talks, one, at least some of the parties uh, consider the other, other parties un, unapproachable, unacceptable for various reasons. And whenever one side is winning or is in itself in an advantageous position, um, it's not. It's less reluctant to make concessions. And the other side is also thinking about how it can improve its position on the battlefield in order to strengthen it. And your previous speaker was absolutely correct. You've got a lot of interested regional parties that can veto any kind of peace agreement, you know, particularly Turkey. Um, I imagine Iran and Hezbollah have some role. I would think that the Gulf players. So I, I, you know, it's just we've got so many actors. It unfortunately reminds me of the worst times of Lebanon, Lebanese Civil War and the Yugoslav Civil War, in which it's just going to be, until there's a major intervention by a foreign power, where all the sides just become so exhausted that they sue for peace. I just worry this is just going to continue, even if at a lower level. So, Igor, as I mentioned, we have uh, the next round of talks coming up in a couple of weeks, uh, well, two or three weeks, in the middle of April. Where do you think they're heading, given everything that you've been saying? Well, it seems that there would be some attempts to, to uh, at least to maintain ceasefire, and probably there might be some attempts to, to start fighting Daesh in, in uh, eastern Syria. Uh, that might be, as a matter of fact, the point where two sides of the um, talks might, might find some common ground. Uh, and the progress which was reported, progress around Palmyra, which was reported this morning, is probably part of these uh, talks and probably part of that common ground. So uh, there might be, I, I do hope that there might be some attempts to, to maintain ceasefire. That might be the major uh, uh, topic for, for the next round of negotiations in April. 
but uh, the rest with the zero sum game approach the rest does not look very very you know positive and, and Samuel Altaki uh, talking about the, this mother of all issues uh, the political transition what options are being discussed for that transition unfortunately the last thing which is given importance in all this is uh, are the Syrians themselves I think uh, uh, nobody is giving any real importance to real negotiations. I, I don't believe in this theater going on in Geneva, uh, because uh, taking into account the lots of grievances between the two sides, under the lights of the media, nothing will happen. And it is not such in such a way that you can solve such a complex crisis. I think there should be Syrian-Syrian dialogue uh, directed and, and managed uh, in, in a much more complex, much more uh, uh, professional way. Uh, what what do you mean by that? Very briefly, what do you mean by that in a more professional way? I mean, they're, they're doing their best, aren't they? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I mean, I mean by that uh, that we need uh, a, a, an Oslo type. Uh, Palestinian Oslo type uh, negotiations where you bring people that you nobody would accept them to, to negotiate each other but they, you bring them to the table and, they, and I think there is a real uh, acceptance uh, for this uh, to sit together uh, the people who, who like we, what had happened in Lebanon, those who had blood on their on their hands on both sides in Lebanon, were those exactly who forged the Altaif agreement. And actually, without going through a, a tedious and multi-layered regional, international, and mainly Syrian Syrian uh, uh, negotiation, where we can forge a new uh, Syrian national pact. Uh, a new kind of, of a governance, a new kind of a, of a, of a nation uh, state, uh, then uh, I think uh, there will be no, no solution. It's not a new, uh, I don't think that the United States and uh, Russia do have the necessary leverage, uh, and ex especially that the Syrians are still very much divided unless they set to sit together and make concessions. And I think the situation now is very much uh, favorable uh, after the Russian uh, uh, withdrawal that both sides are understanding that there will be no zero summing in the game and it will be very important to pursue this uh, to, to make something uh, further in the ground i think both okay. sides are feeling uh, uh, okay so uh, let, let me just go to richard we're running out of time now so ultimately the situation just taking on uh, what we just heard there from samir ultimately uh, any satisfactory outcome will need both sides to agree what's your sense what's your instinct about where this is going in the coming weeks and months uh, we many sides need to agree. So I I think that we're going to see uh, uh, no agreement, but uh, somewhat less uh, fighting, less uh, 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 obstacles, less deaths than in the in in the past. But still an unsatisfactory situation of which I myself am not smart enough to see a good solution at the present time. And Igor, from your point of view. Yeah, I think I would completely agree with that. So we will have a sort of frozen situation without very serious progress, but even frozen conflict is much better than bloodshed, which we have now. And, and Samar Altaki, uh, coming to you finally, uh, you talk about the necessity to, to consider the Syrian people in all of this. I mean, I, this is what has been pushed for for a long time, but the warring, the warring sides... Uh, don't take that into account when they go to the battlefield. How would you bring that, that issue into the fold? How would you take that on? First of all, I didn't speak about the people. I spoke about those who are effectively taking in hand uh, pieces of land here and there, uh, the different land road lords on both sides, the Syrian, Syrian opposition and the, uh, the warlords, sorry, uh, on both sides, the uh, Syrian opposition and the regime. But Nobody has, for example, thought about forming a kind of Syrian Loya Jirga, uh, which was a solution, one, a, a very important step in the solution in Afghanistan, meaning that to, to bring about a certain committee that would, uh, a certain body that would uh, legitimize all procedures that will be needed uh, to be uh, to be agreed upon and uh, there are there are there are many studies about this the possibility of bringing 2000 people representing really the ground not the, those people sitting in, in hotels uh, outside syria or people in the regime there are there are lots of solution here but nobody's really had made the effort to do something regarding regenerating the will of the syrian people but on the other side, nobody is trying to bring those fighters uh, 
uh, to a table, I think they are ready to make some concession. Their situation is not ultimate, and they need lots of of, of, of things. And there is there is something to do in, the, in this level, even at the international uh, level. All right, concessions certainly uh, needed on all counts, uh, gentlemen. That's all we have time for now. Very much appreciate your perspectives on this. Richard Whites, Igor Sudigin, and Sami Altaki. Thank you very much indeed for your time. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Nick Clark, and the whole team here, it's goodbye for now.